Hey everybody, welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. We've got a great show lined up for you today. We're going to be talking about weight struggles. Now, not just being overweight, but also those of you who are underweight. So if you struggle with either building muscle or if you struggle with taking fat off, this is a show you're going to want to listen to. We're going to dive into some very, very key strategies that often get ignored. Uh, when people embark on a program. And so those of you who are maybe following along with No Grain, No Pain, uh, typically the challenge in and of itself um, is sticking to the diet, but the challenge for many people is those weight loss plateaus if you're overweight and that, and, you know, that inability to put mass on because you're restricting your foods down to no grains. And so some people struggle to really find calories and find uh, enough to eat. So we're going to be talking about, again, advanced strategies in there. If you're new to the show, um, if you're new to no grain, no pain, yeah, the rules generally are speaking, get your questions in early. I'll try to do my best to answer as many as I can, uh, but we'll wait till the end to take on all of your specific questions. So type those in early and I can take those first come first serve. So let's dive into tonight's show, which is the top seven body weight mistakes that people make. And number one, um, go figure, you guys could probably have, have guessed this if you've been watching for any length of time, it's people oftentimes are really heavy on the idea of counting calories, right? So let's, let's count calories and, and let's identify, okay, I can only eat so much. You know, the, the, the general consensus or belief is that 3,500 calories is approximate to a pound, right? So 3,500 equals one pound. And so if you can cut 3,500 calories in your diet over the course of a week, then you can lose one pound a week. Again, that's, that's the theory. We'll, we'll put a big highlight by that. That's the theory, right? Because it's not true. Um, it's a theory. And it's never really been truly validated Although there's some truth to it, we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. The real issue is counting calories, but consuming foods that are inflammatory in nature. So if you are cutting your calories, and I see this a lot, people come to me in my practice, and they're eating, let's just say, a Weight Watchers are following a point system, or they're following somebody's point system, or calorie-restricted processed food diet, and they're struggling. They can't you know, they can't put weight on if, if that's their problem. They can't take weight off uh, if that's their problem. They're struggling to normalize body weight or achieve a healthy body weight. And it's because of the inflammation in and of itself. If you're eating things that cause inflammation, this will change your hormones. This will lead to hormone changes. Triangle uh, is just a signal for change. So hormone change, right? And so that hormone change, usually it's affecting cortisol, and it's affecting insulin, ladies. It's affecting your estrogen, those inflammatory foods. And men, it's affecting your testosterone. So um, again, these inflammatory foods create a cascade of hormone change. And so what you're seeing here is something I've shown you in the past a multitude of different times, whereas it, when you're eating the wrong inflammatory foods, you get an inflammatory response that drives an increase in cortisol which leads to muscle loss. And when you lose your muscle, this can, make, this can lead to two different things. It can lead to, you know, lack of muscle equals, for some of you, weight struggles. You, you, you struggle to keep your weight up because you can't keep lean mass on. And that's because of an inflammatory process that chews through your muscle. Remember, elevations in the steroid cortisol leads to the deterioration of your muscle, which slows down your metabolism and, and that makes you tired and groggy and can affect you in a number of different ways. But if you're, if you're underweight, the loss of your muscle makes you lose even more weight because remember, a lot of our mass is our muscle tissue. Now, if you're overweight, an increase in cortisol will also cause you to reduce your muscle mass. But as you reduce your muscle mass and you drive the inflammation process, one of the things that happens with elevated cortisol for many that struggle with their weight is it increases blood glucose, it increases blood sugar. Your liver stores sugar. So in your liver, you store about 325 grams of glucose so that 
if you're chronically inflamed, your corticosteroid, your cortisol, is just asking your liver, hey, we need energy, dump the sugar. Dump your stored sugar into the bloodstream. So what happens is you get hyperglycemic episodes where you're dumping excessive sugar into your blood. Excessive sugar in your blood leads to the formation of something called a triglyceride. Triglycerides are just a fancy way of saying fat. And so what do we do with triglycerides? Generally, what do humans do better than anyone else? They store them as fat extremely efficiently. So triglycerides are stored as fat, and so we end up putting on body weight. So if you're, if you're counting your calories, right, and you're eating this calorically restricted diet, but the food that you're eating, you're not taking care uh, in terms of whether or not it's inflammatory for you or not, again, it can lead to muscle loss. So if you're trying to keep your weight and your mass up, you can't. And it can lead to weight gain in terms of fat gain, like percentage fat gain because it drives and changes your hormones, your cortisol and your blood sugar become affected, leading to more fat storage. So what are, what are the inflammatory foods? Like, what are the key ones? Well, this month we're really focusing on no grain, no pain. So if you don't have a copy of no grain, no pain, check one out at your library, buy one at Amazon or Barnes & Noble, pick a copy up because there's two chapters in the book where we talk about the right diet restrictions to avoid inflammatory foods. And obviously the biggest family of inflammatory food, the biggest one is grains. Um, so that's you know not just wheat, barley, and rye, which is what many celiacs try to avoid to, in an attempt to avoid gluten. But we also look at, at oats and corn and rice and sorghum and millet as, as grains that also need to be avoided. We look at pseudo grains like quinoa and amaranth and buckwheat that also need to be avoided because they can do the same thing right here that we just talked about. And of course there are other inflammatory foods as well and, and, and many of them are, are like sugar is inflammatory and it's not good for you. Processed sugar isn't good for anyone. Um, but then there are other real foods, whole foods that are healthy but if you're reacting to them or you're allergic to them or if you're following this program and you find yourself plateaued or struggling to, to, to get to your ideal body weight and composition, then what may be happening is you're allergic or sensitive to some of the foods that generally are healthy, but for you they're not. And so I've seen everything you can imagine. I've seen people who are reacting to blueberries. I've seen people who are reacting to raspberries, to broccoli, to cauliflower, to green beans, to spinach. You know, things that we would generally consider to be healthy foods. And, and, and those foods, again, if they're inflammatory for you, right? So inflammatory food, we can generalize to a certain extent grains, dairy, and sugar, and genetically modified foods full of pesticides, dyes, and preservatives, all inflammatory. But we can't generalize your unique food intolerances, food sensitivities that are also driving inflammation. So that's something that if you're not aware of, and you're struggling, you really should get it tested. Being tested when you're at a plateau and you don't know why is critical, it's crucial. Um, a lot of people wanna do this at home and do it on their own, and that's fine. You know, It's fine, you can do that, but if you're hitting a plateau, this is the next step, this is the next hurdle, the next level of investigation that you should take. Number two is taking medicines that interfere with healthy metabolism. This is a huge problem in the U.S. particularly. Why is it such a big problem here? The average person 45 years of age and older, um, last, last survey I read was, I, I believe it was between, the average was bet on between three and five prescription medications, which is, in my opinion, an, an atrocity. And it, and it really shows the failure of the healthcare system. If you have the vast majority of the adult population dependent on medicines so that they don't have an acute heart attack or, or a major issue, then what you really have is a bunch of sick people relying on drugs that won't solve their problem because their doctors are too chicken um, to have a real meaningful conversation with them about real meaningful changes. That's the way I, the way I see it. But medicines don't solve problems for most people. Now it's different if you're in an acute care scenario where you have septic you know, bacterial infection in your blood and you need the antibiotic. I get it, take it, it's the right thing to do. But if you're overweight because you don't exercise, you don't sleep, you're under too much stress, you hate your job, you don't um, do the things that you know you need to be doing, and so you've gained weight or, you, or you've, um, you've developed high blood pressure or diabetes or some other various risk factors for poor health, and you think that throwing medicine 
at that is going to solve that issue, you're going to be sorely disappointed, right? We look at America, and of all industrialized countries in the world, America ranks 37th in healthcare, meaning our healthcare system, even though everybody raves about how great it is, we rank, not, we rank 37th uh, among industrialized countries, which is almost dead last, which is very poor considering our healthcare bill annually is about $3.2 trillion. So, you know, generally when you spend money, you expect to get something of value back. But, you know, as a country, when we spend $3.2 trillion and we're ranked last, and all we really have done is enrich pharmaceutical companies and empower doctors to ignore true meaningful aspects of health and to confuse patients into not understanding what really needs to happen in order for them to achieve health, I would say that we've miserably failed. I mean, these big, huge hospitals are not built uh, on goodwill. They're built off of the money that people pour into healthcare. But if you look at all the tombstones that are piling up as a result of healthcare, it's really quite sad. I mean, the number one cause of death arguably is prescription drug use. Um, there have been two major studies published in the last 15 years that concluded that. One was published uh, in the Journal of, of uh, the American Medical Association. Another one was just published a couple of years ago in the British Medical Journal talking about all-cause mortality and the number one cause of death uh, being prescri or approximating the number one cause of death being prescription medication. So how do prescription drugs interfere with healthy metabolism? One of the side effects of, of pretty much all medicines is something called drug-induced nutritional deficiencies. Now some doctors would laugh, say oh, that doesn't matter, nutrition's not important, it's because they're idiots and they haven't been trained in nutrition and they're not qualified to make that statement, so they dismiss it out of turn. But drug-induced nutritional deficiencies is a very real thing. There have been major medical textbooks written on this topic, actually four of them on my bookcase uh, next door. And, and so we, you want to understand that drug-induced nutritional deficiencies, let me give you a couple of examples, common things. So if you're taking a blood pressure medicine, and a lot of blood pressure medications are diuretics, um, and there are different forms of diuretics. There's potassium-sparing diuretics. Uh, there's drugs like Lasix. There's drugs like hydrochlorothiazide. Um, there's a number of different types of diuretics, but ultimately, what do diuretics do? They cause you to pee more. They cause you to lose the volume of your fluid through your kidneys. In essence, you're peeing more frequently in order to lower your blood pressure. So they're manipulating your, your hydration in order to make your blood pressure, to turn your blood pressure to a level that it doesn't increase the risk for you to develop a heart attack or a stroke. Um, we know what, what really does that. What, what does that without diuretics? Exercise and eating well. Those are, are two things that we know for sure lower your blood pressure, but, but diuretics are commonly used. So doctors don't like to talk about lifestyle change because their belief is that patients don't have the capacity for lifestyle change. So they, they make the assumption that you wouldn't change your life or your lifestyle if you knew that it were something that you could do. And so they would rather write the prescription because they can do that in five minutes, but to have the conversation with you takes time and they don't, they don't have the time or they won't make the time, I should really say, they don't make the time to spend it with you, which tells me right there, they don't value the relationship, they don't value real care. I mean, again, I'm not damning all of medical doctors, but that's, that's, a, that's a very general consensus that we can make because how many of you, raise your hand in the audience, how many of you have ever gone to the doctor and the doctor spent 45 minutes with you really, really discussing something that you needed to change or, or how many of you have had the opposite experience where you go to the doctor and they, and they tell you one problem, one copay, and you've got like five minutes and most of the time in the doctor's office is, in, in a, is 45 minutes in the waiting room and then another 45 minutes in the secondary waiting room waiting for the doctor to come in. So again, back to drug-induced nutritional deficiencies, the diuretics. What, what happens with many diuretics is most of them cause CoQ10 deficiency. They will lower your CoQ10. Now, CoQ10 is like a B vitamin. Technically, it's not a B vitamin, but it is a, a substance, a biological molecule that's necessary for metabolic function. It's the what we would call the rate-limiting step for your cells to be able to generate energy from, vi from uh, carbohydrates, fats, and proteins. So as your cells are breaking down macronutrients, carbs, fats, and proteins, you have to have CoQ10 to do this. And if you don't have adequate CoQ10, remember what, what happens with this is you, you don't make enough ATP, which is in a sense energy, which if we really want to use an analogy, ATP is the body's 
energy substrate. In the real world, if we're using real world analogy, ATP is equivalent to money. How do you navigate society if you don't have money to feed yourself, to clothe yourself, to, to, to buy shelter for yourself, right? You, you, would, you, you, know, you would basically be um, homeless, right? So you need money to navigate the world just like your body needs ATP to navigate biochemistry. And when you're taking drugs that deplete your ability to get to that, what is that going to do to your capacity for weight loss, for weight gain, if you need to build mass? So this is just one example. Diuretics also deplete other B vitamins. Uh, as a general rule of thumb, uh, probably one of the most affected vitamins with diuretics is vitamin B1, thiamine. And thiamine deficiency, which is interesting about that, about both B1 and, and CoQ10, uh, or thiamine and CoQ10, is that doctors give you the diuretic to lower your blood pressure to reduce your risk of heart disease, but in doing so, cause vitamin B1 and CoQ10 deficiency. Deficiencies of those nutrients increase your risk of heart disease, right? There's a, there's a disease called beriberi, which is vitamin B1 deficiency, and one of its major side effects is high blood pressure congestive heart failure. CoQ10 deficiency can cause high blood pressure and congestive heart failure. So again, this is just one example. Diuretics causing micronutrient imbalance, which leads to the inability to generate energy that's necessary to run your metabolism and your metabolic functions. We could say the same thing for drugs given for diabetics. Metformin being one of the more common also blocks CoQ10 and certain B vitamins. Um, we could say the same thing, ladies, if you've ever been on birth control pills, estrogen, uh, artificial synthetic estrogen, deplete B6 and magnesium and B12 and B2. So, you know, we know medicines play a major role in this and we know that the average American, again, over the age of 45 is on between three and five medicines. And, and that's prescription. That doesn't, this is not in counting over the counter. So many of you are doing over the counter stuff like aspirin. How many of you are taking aspirin? Your cardiologist says, hey, take aspirin to, for heart health. And aspirin depletes vitamin C and iron and folate. Iron deficiency causes anemia, lack of oxygen leads to the inability, again, for your body to run its metabolism. And you get stuck in this gigantic mess right? A drug-induced nutritional deficit. So this is a major, major problem. If you're on multiple medications or even one medication, you know, have that conversation with your doctor. What are you doing that, that is wrong that requires that you need a medicine to manage your life and what could you be doing differently in order to get to a point where you can get off of that medicine? That really is, is where you want to go. Okay, number three on the list. People get impatient with progress. Um, we live in a society where everybody wants it now. Actually, everybody wants what they want and they wanted it yesterday before they even knew that they wanted it, right? We just live in a very impatient society. And so a lot of people quit before they ever get to a point where they're seeing great progress. Um, I see this all the time. People will stick with a diet for two to three weeks. You know, they say it's too hard. Um, I didn't lose 20 pounds in two to three weeks, therefore I quit or I didn't gain weight, I didn't put the muscle on because I went to the gym you know, for a couple weeks, I quit, right? So impatience is a big, big part of the process. You have to understand, if you're not in shape physically, if your body is under-muscled, it doesn't matter whether you're overweight or underweight, if your body is under-muscled, it didn't get there overnight. And it's not going to fix overnight. You've got to give it time. It takes time to build lean mass. It takes consistency, energy, and effort and, and strategy to get there, and so you can't be impatient with it. Remember, one of the keys, and this is to all aspects of life, not just body weight, is consistency multiplied by time equals a result. So if you are consistently quitting, then your result is going to be nil. If you are consistently doing, right, then your result is going to be beneficial, right? It's going to be good. It's going to be on the up. So you've got to keep that in mind. Don't become impatient with the process. Sometimes, you know, if you've neglected your body for 25 years, don't expect that a week or two or even four or five weeks at a gym is going to, is going to basically reverse 20 years or 25 years of neglect. 
you've got to stay consistent with it. To build lean mass for the average person that has chronic disease, in my experience, takes at least six months to start seeing some really solid mass. Now, if you're overweight, it doesn't take six months to see some of the weight come off. It does if you're, if you're applying the wrong strategy, but it, it doesn't if you're applying the right strategy. And sometimes people are applying the wrong strategies, but, but ultimately you've got to have consistency in what you're doing. Um, and again, consistency in bad behavior will lead to a bad result. Consistency in good behavior should lead to a good result unless your strategy is wrong. And if your strategy is wrong, you should question it. Uh, or if you're failing to achieve a result, you should question the strategy that you're implementing. Uh, number four is a lack of sleep. Um, lack of sleep is crucial. I mean, sleep is, think of sleep as your body's ability to heal and repair, it's the time where you recover, right? So if you, if you, a lot of people, they go to, they do go work out. They are consistent. They're trying to train. They're trying to build their lean mass. But what ends up happening is they have poor sleep hygiene. So they go to bed at midnight. Um, they wake up early. And what they don't allow is their body time to heal and repair the damage they're creating from their exercise. Remember, exercise is basically scheduled damage. It, there's a name in, in biology, it's called hormesis, which means hormesis means you apply stress, you apply a bad thing, stress in this case, the stress of activity, to get to a good thing. So you apply a stress that some perceive as bad to get to a good outcome or a good result. That's what hormetic or hormesis is. Exercise falls, in my opinion, under this, under this category. Um, but with, with exercise, you have to follow that up with sleep. And, and if you don't, what, what generally happens is you don't recover from the strained effect that you induced on your body. So remember, you put your body under tremendous amount of stress through that exercise. You now have to give the body its due and you have to allow it its recovery time or it won't respond well. And there are a lot of hormones that are regulated under the control or auspice of proper sleep. Cortisol is one of them. And we talked about cortisol in that first slide. And now if you don't regulate your cortisol properly, remember the, the longer you go with, with lack of sleep, your body's natural tendency is to try to compensate with that stress of lost sleep by producing the stress hormone cortisol. Remember, cortisol elevates blood sugar. Cortisol also has a feedback system that, that keeps you awake and makes your sleep less sound. So, so it's, it's a vicious cycle once it gets started. So you've got to really prioritize sleep. And one of the things that I would encourage any of you to do is, is, is the bedtime challenge. Like just go to bed on time, right? Don't get in bed at midnight and then by the time your mind winds down because you've been on your phone or you've been on your iPad or whatever it is, um, your mind has to wind down. Your body has to wind down. So get in bed before bedtime in an attempt to wind down so that when it is bedtime, you're actually able to fall asleep as opposed to pushing yourself you know, until midnight or later. Your body heals and restores and repairs between 10 p.m. and 2 a.m. That's the time frame that the most benefit, the most rest and recovery occurs. So treat sleep um, as a top priority if you're trying to normalize your body weight because if you don't, you'll struggle to get there. You won't recover from your exercise, which by the way, too, your exercise is a requirement, um, obviously in order to achieve your ideal body weight. Number five, poor macronutrients. So macronutrients, this refers to carbs, fats, and proteins. So carbs, fats, and proteins are the three macronutrients. And what happens to a lot of people that I see really struggle in this category is they're overcarbing. Their carbohydrate levels are too high, consistently high, and, and so they really, really struggle. Remember, excessive carbohydrates are converted to triglycerides, which is fat. So they're converted to fat and then that's stored. So, you know, we learned, here's how we learn this. If, you, if you're old enough and you remember this, you know, in the 80s, there was this trend, this dietary trend, the no fat, low fat diet, right? And so what did manuf food manufacturers, what did they do in order to, to battle fat, which was the wrong fight to fight? Uh, we can thank medicine for that too. The med it was actually the medical community that demonized fat, healthy fat, in an attempt to turn your attention away from sugar. 
Um, that was actually proven. Harvard researchers were paid off to lie about it. And so they published fake research, fake news, if you will. And, um, and for 20 years, you know, pulled the wool over the eyes of the American populace to eat low fat. But what happened during those low fat years, no fat years? America got, you know, true or false, America got skinnier. Um, you know, that would be false. America became obese during that 20 year time stretch where we took fat out of the diet. Fat's a crucial macronutrient and fat actually helps us to burn fat. It's, it's, you know, most people think, well, if I eat fat, I'll get fat. And that's not true. If you, if you carb toxic yourself with, with too many carbs, then you'll definitely store more fat. And if you don't get enough fat, you won't burn fat as a fuel efficiently. Your body loses its capacity to use fat as energy. So you become very, very poor at metabolizing fat into energy. So you just keep storing more and more and more. Um, so what do we want to do here? We, what is a good balance? For most people, what's a good balance? And so a lot of you have done like ketogenic diets to lose weight. Some of you have done maybe carnivore diets to lose weight and had success. Those diets in and of themselves are imbalanced in different ways. Like a keto diet is a high fat diet. A carnivore is a high protein diet. And I would say, yes, if you start, if you start from the premise where you have been eating high carbs most of your life and then you go carnivore or keto, you're going to lose weight. But you're going to get to a point when you're eating high fat and high protein where that actually starts to become a detriment for different reasons. So what are we really after here is we're after balance, just like with, with all things, right? We want balance. And so what, what we're after is we're after kind of a third of our calories, a third fat, a third carb, a third protein in terms of your total calorie intake. Now, you don't have to be perfect in it. So, you know, one day you might get 40% of your calories from protein. Um, and another day you might get 40 from carbs. Another day you might get 40 from fat. So it's not going to be a perfect third. You don't want to aim, you know, to create like a, a mental distress over did you get it 33.33% infinity accurate. This is a general guideline and a general rule. You want to try to keep a semblance of balance in your macronutrients. Most people thrive on that platform right there, provided the food they're eating is not inflammatory. But what I see again, a lot of times is you follow a program like, uh, like they, they give you points. And so it doesn't matter. The points are just points. They're representative of calories. And so it doesn't matter whether your calories come from this, this, or this. It's just an accumulation of your total calories in the day. And if you're not ma macronutrient balanced, then what ends up happening is you struggle achieving your weight goal. Um, and so that, that, that's where a lot of people are, right? Especially here. This is, in today's world, this is the big one. It's carbohydrate toxicity. So balance out those macronutrients. We also have another one, number six, which is failure to address nutritional deficiencies. So vitamin and mineral deficiencies um, are crucial. As I mentioned earlier with medicines, many medicines actually inhibit or cause a deficiency in, in vitamins and minerals. And that's why they disrupt you. So you might have a diet where you're nutritionally devoid. You might not be getting adequate nutrients in the diet that you're currently eating. You maybe, maybe you've been just been recently told you have a gluten issue. And so you got years of gluten induced damage, which, which comes with malnutrition, nutrient deficiencies. And so maybe you're deficient in zinc and you're deficient in certain B vitamins and you're deficient in selenium. And so, you know, I could talk about biochemical examples all day long. Selenium is important for thyroid hormone function. And if you don't have selenium, your thyroid won't drive your metabolic function appropriately, you're not going to effectively run your metabolism. We could say the same thing about certain B vitamins. We could say the same thing about other minerals and their functions. But at the end of the day, micronutrient imbalance becomes a major problem for many people who are stuck. Again, if you're doing everything else right up to this point and you're stuck, you know, one of the easy things that you can consider at this point is a really high quality. I'm not talking about your you know, going over to the drugstore and buying that, that $6 bottle of multivitamins that's full of junk. I'm talking about a very high quality multivitamin mineral complex. And this is just as a, kind of almost like insurance. If you have enough, uh, if you have enough major deficiency, this is not going to correct it. But if you just need a little extra support, this could be the, this could be the make or break it for you. 
the extra B vitamins or the extra minerals in a good multivitamin, multimineral formulation. Um, you have to be careful with these because a lot of them, you know, they sell them, they look good, the package is pretty, but what's actually in the package is uh, vitamins and minerals that don't mix well with biochemistry, a bunch of corn or sugar or grain fillers that you want to try to avoid. So be careful when you're picking one out. Um, but this can be, again, another big issue for a lot of folks. And then the last on the list is incorrect exercise. And this is different for different people. So, you know, a lot of people, a lot of programs you get online and they're kind of like one size fits all with exercise, like do my program or do this program. And some people, um, you know, have tried a lot of different programs and failed. Uh, but at the end of the day, the right exercise becomes important. What does that mean, the right exercise? It depends on where you're at. I've, I've seen cases where people um, that shouldn't be um, in a CrossFit gym, which is very, you know, aggressive exercise, where you get somebody who hasn't exercised in 20 years and they walk into that kind of a gym and they injure themselves and now they can't exercise because they're injured, right? That would be sabotaging your progress and an approach to exercise that's incorrect. You start with where you're at. So like if you're a 65-year-old female and you haven't exercised in 10 years, you, you gotta start with some fundamentals first. And what, one of the things I would recommend is get with a qualified, experienced, exercise expert, trainer, somebody who's got you know five plus years of experience working with people in your age group because a lot of the trainers today, you can hire somebody who's really good, but if all they've ever done is train bodybuilders to compete and you're a 65 year old female, it's the wrong hire. They're not gonna understand your needs, your biochemistry. They're not gonna understand your level. They're gonna try to put you into the same position they put the bodybuilders that they train. And that, that's a recipe for injury. So you've got to, you know, if you, need, if you need help, if you need specific guidance, you want to hire somebody who understands you and your age group and your status, where you're at along the spectrum of physical fitness. Because this is an area that far too often people go in, they get injured, and once you're injured, you know, if you're already malnourished and then you get injured, now your injury won't heal. And so then that just gives you another six month excuse right, to, to, to keep not doing the things that are necessary for you to improve your health overall. So exercise is very important. So uh, take it at your pace. I, the best thing I can say is take exercise at your pace, listen to your instinct, don't do more. It's always better to do less, err on the side of caution, doing less to first figure out how your body will react and respond. And then if you react and respond well, slowly increase the resistance, slowly increase the difficulty level, slowly increase the complexity uh, and, and move up from there. So, so but don't, don't try to go all in, all complex, all challenging. And, and you know, if you haven't trained in a long time, we have a name for that for men um, that, you know, that, you know, sometimes that you hear this where, where young men, when they were young anyway, they played like football or they played a major sport and then you know, 20 years goes by and they're working a desk job every day and then they go out on the weekend and they try to play the sport as if they never uh, sat at a desk for 20 years deteriorating. We call those people weekend warriors, right? Because they go out on the weekend, they try to do what they used to do and they injure themselves out. So don't, don't be that person. Um, approach it with strategy. Approach it with, with a plan um, that matches where you're at in your fit, within your fitness level so that you don't injure yourself and then, you know, create the the you know the environment where you can't exercise at all so those seven strategies the top mistakes i see again doesn't matter whether you're trying to put weight on or whether you're trying to lose weight and now we'll go into your questions we'll try to keep them on topic tonight so let's see what we got here is fasting or cold therapy better to convert white fat to brown fat I don't, you know, I think if you're if you're trying to to convert white fat to brown fat so that you can burn it better, I, I think the best thing that you can do is fasting. Um, you do cold. I mean, you could do either one. They're both good. Um, you know, one of the things I like to do is is you know not necessarily ice baths, as in depending on what kind of cold therapy you're talking about, because there are levels of cold therapy. But ice baths, pretty cold, and some people get in cryo chambers, and some people, you know, take cold showers. Um, you know, super cold showers, and all of those things can be effective strategies. Uh, is carob okay as a chocolate substitute? Yes and no. 
Um, carob is a legume, and so some people do react to it uh, or don't digest it very well. It's hard to break down. So you just have to, you have to assess it for yourself if you haven't, if you haven't been tested. But carob is gluten-free, so in that regard, it's okay as a chocolate substitute and as a caffeine-free version of chocolate or something that resembles chocolate. Uh, I have celiac. I lost 10 pounds in two years. A mainstay at 145. Is that an indication that I may be handling this disease well? Um, Karen, I could answer that better if I knew how tall you were. Um, but losing 10 pounds in two years is relative because if you started out, you know, if you're, if you know, let's say for example, you're 5'2", if you're 145 pounds, you're overweight by about 20 pounds. Uh, unless, unless you're 145 with heavy, heavy muscle density. Um, so your height does matter there. Um, it's an indication, not really of much, if it's just 10 pounds of, of general weight loss, because a lot of people that find out they're celiac and, and go on a gluten-free diet, um, they're going to lose weight in that first, especially in that first six months, mainly because they're reducing their inflammatory burden. And so a lot of times we lose weight, and it's water weight. It's not actually fat that we're losing definitively because I, you know the devil's in the details there. Um, is losing too much water weight too quickly not safe? Um, low, breath, low breath pressure, dehydration, no. Um, and we'll define too much. I mean, if you're, doing, if you're doing something like no grain, no pain, you're not gonna lose too much too quick. I, I would argue the opposite. If you're taking a diuretic and your dose is increased by your doctor, you, you could actually create a greater loss and a greater problem usually with medications than you can with diet change. Uh, how many pounds of muscle do we gain in a month of heavy training, uh, men versus women? It, it's, I wish I'd give you more exact value. It's not an exact number. It's not how many pounds of muscle. I, I, I generally, what I try to have people do is, is analyze their body fat composition when they start uh, and there are scales that you can buy. Uh, Tanita, T-A-N-I-T-A, -A, is a good company. They make a really good body fat scale. Um, where, where, but if you're going to do body fat measurements, however you do it, do it the same way each time you measure. Don't, don't like one day have your fat cal, have your, you know, your your trainer do fat calipers on you, and then the next time you're measuring it with a handheld device, and the next time you're measuring it with a fat body fat scale. However you measure it, measure it the same way each time for consistency's sake. But, um, you know, if you're, depending on how overweight you are, or how under-muscled you are, again, and how hard you train, there's so many variables within that question that there's not like a magic number. Um, if you are overweight, let's say you're 20, 25 pounds overweight, what's a, safe, what's a safe digression of weight? About a pound a week, and that includes if you're putting muscle on during that process. So as you gain a little bit of muscle, you should still average, if you're doing it, that where it's going to last you and have long-term lasting effects, you should be losing about a pound a week. Now, some people will have more than that initially if they're really obese. Um, we'll see in that, in that, in a, like I've seen people in a month, I've seen them lose 35, 40 pounds just like that, just because they were so overweight to start with. So again, it, part of it depends too on where you're starting. Can BCAA and L-carnitine help me gain more muscle? Um, branch chain amino acids, that's what BCAA stands for, um, for those of you who don't know. Yes, BCAA, it's not that they help you gain more muscle, it's that they help you recover from, from your workout. So, you know, if you're working out and you're doing resistance training, and your muscles are getting so sore. You know, some of this is what happens to some people is they're malnourished, they go work out, they get so sore they can't walk for a week. This is where something like branch chain amino acids can really help in your recovery. Branch chain amino acids, when you take them after your workout, within an hour after your workout, they can be very, very effective at helping reduce delayed onset muscle soreness and helping you recover better. And when you recover better, you put on muscle quicker. So in that regard, yes. Not so much L-carnitine. L-carnitine's job, is it is it taxi it's a taxi for fat it shuttles fat into the mitochondria for for breakdown for something called beta oxidation so it, it taxi cabs the fat into the right location to break it down as energy it doesn't say it doesn't so much though help with with pure muscle growth i'd say in my experience if you're talking about supplements if you really are trying to put mass on there are certain supplements that can help you do that 
Um, I'll give you a quick list of them here. L-glutamine is one of them. L-glutamine, branch chain amino acids, overall getting adequate protein in your diet. This is where a lot of people fail. They get enough fat, they get enough carb, but they're way under on their protein. You really, if you're trying to put on mass, 1.6 to 2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. Um, so, you know, most people are, are, are somewhere around 0.8 grams per kilogram of protein in their diets when they count, at least in my experience. And so they're half the protein that they need or require to build lean mass is not being consumed in the diet. And so they really have to bump the protein levels up. Branch chain amino acids, as I said earlier, help you recover. So does glutamine. Glutamine is, when you work out, when you lift weight, glutamine is the first amino acid that leaves the muscle. And so you, you want to replace that after a workout. So anywhere between two and five grams, depending on your size um, of, of glutamine after a workout. Uh, and you got to be careful because if you take too much too quick, it give you a headache. You take too much too quick, it give you diarrhea. So always say start, start low and build your way up and see how well your bowels tolerate it because some people, again, get to three grams and that, that, that's plenty. If they try to go to five, they start having bowel problems. So again, cautious, caution there. Branch chains, six grams of branch chain amino acids is a good amount. Uh, to get in post-recovery, and then adequate protein. I've listed the number there. And then another supplement that's very effective is creatine monohydrate. And this is, um, you know, the, the bodybuilding world has really capitalized on, on this supplement over the years. It's one of the most effective supplements with some of the most some of the most proven research of effectiveness. Creatine monohydrate's not dangerous. It doesn't hurt your kidneys. There's no toxicity if you take it right. Um, and so it's very, very safe, but it's also extremely effective at allowing you to put on more mass in shorter periods of time. So creatine monohydrate for the average person, five grams a day, again, taken post-workout is a good dose um, to, to look for. But those are, are just good places to start if you just aren't sure what to take. Because if you ever open up, you know, I don't know how many of you listening ever look at at like the, the, the web blogs of, for body weight and, and bodybuilding, but there's a lot of garbage in that world. There's a lot of junk science and there's a lot of junk product that's loaded with sugar and loaded with um, inflammatory ingredients. A lot of the supplements are, are coated with, with sugars and artificial sweeteners and, and dairy-based fillers and grain-based fillers. And so the act of using those supplements can actually create inflammation you know, you know, for those of us in the, in the gluten-free realm. Let's see here. So question on how to increase iron absorption when ferritin is low, regardless of eating more iron rich food. Um, increase your vitamin C. Vitamin C enhances iron absorption from the food that you eat. Um, and if you're eating, if you're not eating organ meat, that's one of the best ways to get dietary iron in. Um, but the other thing there, Yasmin, is you may not have an iron problem. Low ferritin doesn't always mean iron deficiency. So I don't, I don't know if you've, if you've measured other parameters of your nutrition, um, but, but you may not need necessarily more iron if your ferritin is low. It, you may, but, but there are nuances to that that it, it may not mean what you think it does. Uh, do we need to worry about, os about osteoporosis if we don't eat enough collagen? No. Um, no, I mean, you should, you should, what is enough collagen? I don't think there's ever been anybody who's tried to analyze how much collagen a human should eat in a day to not have osteoporosis. So I don't even know how we would begin to qualify that question in terms of what does it mean to eat enough. Um, so, so maybe ask it more specifically if you had something else in mind. <laughs> Russ, does a smiling face help reduce cortisol levels. It sure does. I should probably smile more when we talk. I don't know if that was a subtle hint. Um, let's see. Is organic mustard okay to eat? Depends, Diana, on what it's made from. A lot of your mustards are white vinegar. And so again, that's generally, most white vinegars are corn derivative, so I don't recommend it. Now, there are some great mustards that are made from apple cider vinegar, you know, and that would be perfectly fine, but you just got to watch out for that white vinegar if it is a corn derivative. 
So Pam saying, I might be eating some wrong foods to cause it, but I do believe I have a yeast infection. Can sticking to the no grain and, and uh, foods for 30 day challenge heal that up or do I need to do more? I've always gone to a medical doctor, but would rather not if, if it's avoidable. Could this infection also be uh, causing weight, uh, the, causing the weight to stay on? Yeah, I mean, yeast overgrowth is a major contributor. One of the things, we've talked about this a number of times, Pam, um, yeast produce proteins that mimic gluten. So if you've got a yeast overgrowth, even if you're on the no grain diet, your body could be behaving and reacting as if it's getting gluten exposure. Sometimes if a person has a robust immune system, diet changes enough to balance out the gut flora, sometimes not. So it just depends. There's some natural things that you can do to kind of bring help, help stabilize and balance the gut flora. And one of them is caprylic acid. Uh, caprylic acid is a, is a supplement that has a lot of antifungal properties and that can help bring balance back to your microbiome. We actually we have a product called Ultra Caprylic Acid. We also have a supplement called Yeast Shield, which is, again, it's designed, it's, it's got a number of different herbals in it that can help with that process. And that, those things can be very effective for a lot of people, but it ultimately just depends on how bad your situation is. How can I get enough protein on this diet without beans, peas, legumes, dairy, without eating meat two times a day? Um, one of the best ways is to do free-form amino acids. Free-form amino acids are um, basically non-meat-based essential amino acids and other amino acids. I have, I have a formula, let's change that color, uh, called Ultra Aminos. And, um, you know, a lot of people do well with that as an addition to getting more protein in their diet. Uh, we also have a formula, it's a vegetarian based formula. Um, we can put a link up, but it's a, it's a vegan protein powder that you can add to your diet. We just changed the name of it, so I don't, uh, I'm having a, a brain fart here on the name. Mel, can you pull that up and maybe put that? It's our, it's our uh, used to be ultra protein, but I think we call it warrior protein now. Um, but it's, a, it's an organic, uh, easy to digest protein. And uh, that may be another way you can get your protein levels up when you're following the diet and trying to avoid certain foods. Um, let's see, we'll go down on the left. Is it true that organ meats are more nutritious than vegetables? Yes and no. It depends on the quality of the organ meat, and it also depends on the quality of the vegetable. Um, I, I would argue that there's merit to both sides of that conversation. I know a lot of the carnivore advocates will tell you that pound for pound organ meat's better than vegetable. I, I say it depends on where the vegetable was grown, what soil it was grown in, how healthy it is when it was harvested, whether it was sprayed or whether there were any chemicals used in the processing of it. All that matters, but I, I think Pound for pound, I think the best diet, the most nutritionally dense diet would be real food, right? Including a diet that had organ meats and vegetables in it as well. Can eating grain make me susceptible to mold? I'm gluten sensitive and have mold issues. So yes, grains oftentimes are contaminated with mold and mycotoxins. Um, it's very, very common. There was a, you know, originally years ago, there was a condition called bread madness. And one of the causes of bread madness was grain. Obviously the term bread, right, madness, but it was grain contaminated with a type of mold called ergo, um, which had different chemical compounds in it that would cause hallucin hallucinogenic effects. So, um, you know, there definitely grains can be contaminated with mold. And some people actually respond, actually wrote in depth about that in No Grain, No Pain, the, the uh, mold issues within the grain itself. Uh, let's see, go down a little bit more on that. Uh, let's see, if I have to avoid grains on top of having discarded gluten because I have celiac, then what am I going to eat? Melvin, that's a great question. Um, what I would encourage you to do is go back and watch the last few shows, and if you haven't already, read No Grain, No Pain. There's a list of all the foods. So, you know, one of the things is, okay, what do I avoid? And then the other is, what, what do I eat, right? So we know what to avoid. What are my other options? Literally, there are over 300 options of fruits, vegetables, nuts, and meats that can be consumed on the no grain, no pain diet. So there's a ton of diversity in the diet. It's just you have to make yourself more familiar 
um, with it and more familiar around your taste buds, right? Creating recipes and things that, that might be beneficial. The other thing I would encourage you to do, Melvin, is go to Gluten-Free Society. At the top, there's a menu that says uh, recipes. Click on that and, um, and you can categorize the recipes by diet type, by what you're trying to follow. But there are over 250 recipes there that might give you some great ideas on um, how to better eat while navigating the diet. Is there a test to see if you have antibodies um, for the not talked about virus? Not talking about a PCR. Yeah, there's a, there's a testing. I mean, we do tests that, um, that measure you know, the disease that shall not be named. We measure IgG and IgM antibodies to the spike protein and to the capsid proteins to see if somebody has had exposure. So those tests are readily available. I mean, you can ask most doctors today know about them and will run them or can run them. So Barbara's saying, if you said if you plateau to get tested, but for what or what kind of testing? So if you're plateauing and you're doing all these things, so you should be tested for food sensitivity to make sure you're not sabotaging yourself by eating an otherwise healthy food that isn't healthy for you. You should have your micronutrition levels tested to make sure you don't have any deficiencies that are contributing to, you know, to your inability to, to have good progress. So those are the two main tests that, that I would encourage you uh, to look for. Let's see. My doctor told me, I know you want to find the cause of your migraines, but I defer to your neurologist. Protocol is injection if days of migraine are over 15 days. Uh, yeah, I don't, there wasn't a question in that, more of just, I think, commentary. Yeah, I mean, that, how much sense does that make? We, we don't want to ask why, we just want to give you something. If we don't know why the disease is there, then why would we know how to fix it? That, that was always what confused me in the medical community. Is glycerin safe to eat every day? In, in what way and in what quantity? Um, if you're using so dried, sugar-free cranberries with glycerin, I, I'd, I'd say you're probably okay. It, quantity, you know, specific quantities. Um, you know, if you're, if you're half a cup or less, I think you'd be fine. What nutrient deficiency can be caused by taking channel blockers? Define channel blockers. Uh, what are you referring to? Is that um, is that a product? Is that something? That, I mean, I'm, I'm not I'm not aware of that term in the way you're using it, or maybe there's a misspell there. Um, metformin depletes B12. Yep, thiazide depletes magnesium. Both true statements. How would you approach small fiber neuropathy? Same way I approach. Any, anybody's problem um, is you got to get to the core reasons of why it happened. I mean, small fiber neuropathy is a demyelinating neurological disease or a damaged nerve. There are a number of reasons why nerves can be damaged. Most of the, those reasons, um, or not most, but many of those reasons may be food-based, eating food that causes an inflammatory process within the nerve itself. Um, you could have malnourishment, B12 deficiency, you could have B1 deficiency. There are a number of nutrients that can, deficiencies that can lead to small fiber neuropathy. You can also have heavy metal exposures or other chemical exposures that are damaging your nerves. It's not uncommon to see that occur with heavy pesticide exposure. So, I mean, there's a, we would measure all those things. We'd be very objective and measure those things to see, um, you know, what it was that was contributing to it for you. I love this testimony. Ryan says, I suffered with ulcerative colitis for 17 years and have taken over 45,000 pills. Over the years, try to combat the symptoms. I, I bought no grain, no pain, and I've been off meds for two years. How long did it take you, Ryan, to get to that level following no grain, no pain? I'd love to know that, and congratulations, and thanks for sharing. Um, Yeah, so a 93-year-old mother with Alzheimer's in the hospital, IV antibiotic drip for perforation in the small intestine. Other than IV antibiotics and surgery, do you know of any other intervention? No, that's an acute care situation, Diana. You got to let the doctors do their work in an acute care environment like that. But, you know, you know, God willing, she, she makes a full recovery. You got to get her diet changed if you don't want. I mean, my experience, the bowel perforation generally is this poor diet. I mean, the diet is, is a big, big key part to that.
Let's see. Would alcohol be considered the fourth macro? No, alcohol would be considered a poison um, that some people imbibe on to deal with and cope with reality and stress, but I wouldn't call it the fourth macro. That's, that's putting too much um, importance on it. Macronutrients are essential for human function and biology. Alcohol is not an essential. Some people would argue that, I think, but, um, but I would argue right back. Should we assess first to heal the gut before taking any vitamins or minerals in order to assess nutritional deficiency? No, um, that's called piecemealing, Melanie. This is what happens to a lot of people is they think, if I start by assessing the gut, or I start by fixing the adrenals, or I start by one thing, fill in the blank, um, the body doesn't work in a vacuum where if you fix one thing, everything falls into place like a perfect domino. There's too many variables and there's too much... Um, there's too much unpredictability. You have to start comprehensively. You, you start with the gut, you start with looking at nutrition, you start with looking at food, you start with looking at chemical exposures, and you do it all at the same time, and you address it all simultaneously. Because sometimes what happens, you can start with the gut, and let's just say you're, you're, you're doing some different diet changes to address the gut, but you're deficient. Let me just use one example, zinc deficiency as the example. Let's say you're zinc deficient. Your gut will never heal without zinc. And so if you try to fix your gut with diet change, but you don't have enough zinc, then your gut isn't going to correct. You're, you know, so you're stuck in this place, right? And, you, and that's where people get frustrated because they said, I did the gut program and it didn't work, but they didn't assess their nutrition simultaneously or address it. So it all has to be done simultaneously together. If it's not being done that way, whoever you're working with, whether you're doing it yourself or if you're working with a practitioner or a doctor, we call that piecemealing. Right? And piecemealing is the quickest way to go bankrupt and get very, very piss poor results, just to be frank with you. A lot of people don't realize it. A lot of doctors are gun shy. They don't, they don't want to overwhelm a person. Again, they're, putting, they're presuming that you as an individual would be overwhelmed if they gave you too much information in too short a period of time. And I think that's a terrible presumption to make. I think delivering the information is the most critical thing that a doctor can do to, to, for their patients so that their patients have the capacity and the ability to make the decision that's right for them. And so to presume that a patient will or won't do something is the wrong approach, and, but a lot of doctors do it that way, and that's why so many people get piecemealed to death, not, not literally to death, but they just get piecemealed. You spend $500 on some supplements, you spend $500 on some testing, six months goes by, you're not feeling better, you tried that program, you tried this program, then you do some different testing, and you do some different testing, and it just, they kind of string you out or string you along, or you go from one to the other to the other, but nobody's ever real comprehensive. Like that's your sign that you're doing it wrong. And if that's what's happening to you, or if you're listening to this, even, uh, even if you're not the one that asked the question, that's called piecemealing and it never works. It always fails. I get it all the time in my practice. People come to me from all over the world where they've been piecemealed into, into um, a, a dark place, right? A really dark place. So you've, you've got to be comprehensive from the get-go. You can't piecemeal it. I, I mean, I, I wrote an entire chapter on that and No Gray, No Pain on how not to piecemeal. So, um, if, again, if you don't have a copy, go back and read it. How accurate are the digital weight and body fat scales um, that you would have in your bathroom? I, again, I think the Tanita scales are great. Um, as far as accuracy, are they more accurate than a pod that you could get in at a major university doing research, like a water pod? No. But I think for the, for the sake of consistently measuring, they do a good job. They may not get, let's say that you, you get on a scale like that and your body fat's 14% per the measurement. Those scales have a plus or minus deviation variance. And so you may not really be exactly 14% body fat. Maybe you're really 16% body fat. But if you're measuring consistently and the numbers coming down, then you have a way object to objectively measure yourself to know that you're making progress. What is antidepressor drugs do? Um, so, okay, what, what do antidepressants do to the body? I mean, mostly they just confuse it. Um, 
you know, there, there are times where antidepressants can be helpful for a person. Maybe some, you know, some people will get to a point where they're suicidal, and I think there's a place for that. Um, but I think as, as a whole, doctors too frequently try to use antidepressants to get patients out of their office and leave them alone. I mean, I'm gonna just put it bluntly. Um, a lot of times when a person is sick and a doctor doesn't understand why, they, they don't want to dig deeper. They don't have the capacity to dig deeper, so they would rather just run you off with an antidepressant and label you as a psych patient. And I think that's a bad move. I think most people, that's, that's why they're on those drugs. Um, that's not to say that they can't ever be useful or helpful, but again, most, I think, are on it for the wrong reasons. So I like this question. Gaia wants to know ideas of lunches to pack for teenage boys if gluten and grains are not an equation. Um, you know, I just ate earlier today. I had a roast. I had roast. I, I used glass Tupperware and I had roast and I had some sweet potato and some carrots um, packed away. And I have a floor heater that I use to heat my meals up, but um, that way I don't have to use a microwave. Not everybody has, you know, has, has the time to, to use a floor heater, but um, heating it is another matter altogether. You can pack food, you can warm it up at home, and you can pack it in a thermal uh, type cooler to, to keep it warm for your children. But, you know, any, think of lunches as the same thing that you would think for dinner. I mean, for, you know, for my lunch yesterday, I had uh, chicken fajita meat with, uh, you know, with citrus juice and, and, and chopped peppers and onions and, um, and avocado. So, I mean, that, they're, they're, Think, I think where we get stuck is we want something that we can finger food into our mouth because that's what lunch has become in terms of the tradition. So we want like the sandwich idea or the finger food idea, like a bag of potato chips or something. And those are just, obviously they're, they're, they're horrible for you. So think of lunch as you would think of dinner. Think of lunch as an extension of leftovers from dinner the night before. That's typically what I eat for lunch. So whatever meat, vegetables, um, that you're consuming at dinner time, make enough that you can pack lunches for your kids. A lot of times kids will be like, you know, that's embarrassing, this is weird food, the other kids are eating, you know, junk food and garbage. There's a lot of social pressure at school for kids to eat trash, right? To eat fake food or, or what we like to call fruit. Um, way, the way my oldest son dealt with it uh, was pretty unique. He actually is, you know, he had, he had some of his, some of his friends were making fun of his school lunch and you know, I guess in this case, my son had the advantage because he was the fastest one on his soccer team, and um, and he was the high, he had the highest grades in his class. So you know, when people made fun of his lunch, he just said, "Look, I make better grades than you, so I'm smarter and I'm faster than you. So physically, my food must be doing something for me that yours isn't." And then what he what he kind of paraphrased and turned it around and said is, he says, "Look, I have real food. Bottom line is, I'm eating real food because my mom packs me lunch because she loves me. What's wrong with your mom?" And he really flipped the phrase around onto the other kids. And it wasn't really to insult them so much as it was just to say, leave me alone. My food is awesome because my mom cares about me. And I think if more parents taught their kids to do that, I think we would see kids understanding the value of food more in schoolhouses. But what we've really done is we've outsourced schools to educate our children about things they shouldn't be being educated. And we've outsourced school lunchrooms to feed our children the, the Franken foods. Um, and, and who is in control of that menu? I mean, it's, it's Coke, it's Pepsi, it's all these companies and corporations that are selling the nonsense to the schools at a cheap price. So they're basically taking your tax dollars to poison your children, both their minds and their bodies. And I think it's time as parents we recapture that by taking a stand against the schools and against the peer pressure that's unreasonable in the schools. Because if we always fall back on peer pressure, we don't want to make others feel uncomfortable for our needs. No, we don't, but we also don't want to be sick for the rest of our lives and, and doom ourselves to cancer, heart disease, because we don't want to make somebody else feel comfortable and face the truth. I think the time for progress uh, is now, and I think the time for truth is now, and we all have to, to speak our truths. Uh, let's see, did I miss anything on there? Let's see. Oh, so Victoria's asking, when, when is our food sensitivity test coming out? We're, we're, we're dialing it in. We've got um, some final phases, and I'm hoping to have it out here by the end of first quarter this year. I was hoping to have it out by January. Just We had some kinks that we had to work out in logistics. So it, very, very close. So just be patient with me. Um, creatine, would it be more useful pre-workout? Pre no, post-workout be most useful post-workout within an hour after consumption or after a workout.
<laughs> I feel very piecemealed. Thank you for the clarification. Good, good. That's the first step. And knowing you have the wrong doctor you're working with is if you feel very piecemealed. Um, run far and fast because ultimately um, that, that's the way of, 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 we'll just say, resultless poverty. Um, let's see, keep going down that left, just uh, keep going down that left. How do you stop, I like this question, um, how do you stop carb cravings, Amy's asking. Um, if you're craving carbs, there's several reasons why people crave carbs, simple reasons, they're more than the ones I'm going to list to you, but these are very common. One is B vitamin deficiency. A lot of people crave carbs are low in B vitamins, so maybe consider a B complex vitamin. Another reason is chromium deficiency, chromium, C-H-R-O-M-I-U-M, -M, chromium. We can put a link up to those two, chromium and, and B vitamins. Um, those are two very common reasons why carbohydrate cravings are strong in individuals as they're changing their diet. And it's because you can't process carbohydrates into energy without B vitamins and chromium. And so what happens is you are eating the carbs, but you can't convert it to energy. And so you're storing it as fat possibly, and your body will send a message back to the brain that says, hey, we're not getting enough energy. We need more carbs to make energy. But again, you lack the biochemical nutrients necessary to do that energy conversion. Another reason we'll see, um, common cravings is um, yeast overgrowth. A lot of people with yeast overgrowth will crave carbohydrates. Those are probably three of the top reasons that we see. So, so looking into those three areas might, might serve you, Amy. Elizabeth wants to know, what is uh, more important to know, your BMI, your body mass index, or your body weight? I think body mass index is a waste. My body mass index is, a, is so if, if you look at my body mass index, it's over 25. So on paper, if you didn't know me and, and you couldn't see me, you would look at me on paper and you would say, Dr. Osborne is obese. Uh, body mass index is very misleading in that way. Now, don't get me wrong, body weight is not any different in some aspects because you can have somebody who's, who weighs more than what you might think they should for their height, but because they're super muscled, they weigh more. Uh, muscle weighs more than fat. And so a lean but very muscled individual might weigh more and look obese, again, on paper with, with BMI or even through weight. I don't think, I think if you're measuring something consistently, measure your body fat percentage. It's very inexpensive to do a body fat um, scale. And so if you're, if you're trying to measure a, a, a benchmark that you can follow consistently for a result, body, I don't think body mass index is it. I think body fat percentage is, is what you should be looking at. My thoughts on whey protein is most whey proteins are garbage um, because they're highly processed, denatured proteins, and so they're highly inflammatory. We see a lot of people on whey proteins that struggle with joint pain and inflammation, muscle pain and inflammation. I mean, there's no doubt, there's the research on whey protein shows that you can recover from a workout using whey protein, but the problem with most of the whey proteins on the market is they're full of fillers and junk, and a lot of the dairy products that are being used to make the whey are, are from sick animals, so I'm not a fan of whey protein. I, we have something called ultra pure protein, which is a serum-derived um, beef protein that I would recommend. It's far superior to whey in terms of its, its outcomes and, and um, reliability, but also in terms of its health. Is it dangerous for Hashimoto's or, or um, is it dangerous for people with Hashimoto's to fast or do one meal a day? No, it's not dangerous. I, th I think it, part of it depends on how well your blood sugar is, is regulated. If it's not very well regulated, you might struggle with one meal a day, but I wouldn't call it dangerous. How do you test for toxins? Very deliberately, Kim. Um, there's a lot of different ways to test for toxins depending on which type of toxin we're talking about. There's not like one magical test that we wave a wand and say every toxin is tested if you just do this one thing. It's, it's a multitude of different things um, that we actually look at. Eye twitching, even while taking magnesium, you might also have a calcium deficiency, Ralda, so maybe take that calcium with magnesium simultaneously, CalMag. Um,
Is there a chance of getting off of medicine? I'm, I'm post-ablative hypothyroid. Is there a chance of getting off of medicine when healing the gut? Yes, there is a chance. There's a very great chance. So my friend has an Asperger overweight and diabetic type 2. Um, I'm assuming you mean child. Um, what could be specific advice to, oh, maybe it's just your friend. What would be specific advice to him as an autistic spectrum person? He craves carbs and exercises every day. I mean, I wouldn't give him any different advice than I would give anyone else just because he's Asperger or on the spectrum. You know, he's probably on the spectrum to a certain extent. It's probably worse because of the way he's eating. So I give him honest advice. Um, but there's not like a magic pill there. I, I know a lot about people with Asperger or autistic diagnoses do really, really well on a gluten and dairy-free diet and a sugar-free diet. So I, I probably would say specifically start there. And, and if you notice improvements or changes or differences, then you, you, know, you keep going and, and get more specific along the way. I found amazing savory crepes at Costco made out of egg whites and cauliflower. I think that's just more of a comment. Make sure they're organic and make sure the egg whites are, um, you know, from pasture raised hens. And so somebody's commenting about the way. My way has no fillers and is made from happy goats. Well, then, you know, if, as long as you're not allergic to dairy specifically, I, I don't have a problem with whey. Whey can be you know, a helpful thing. I think what's the, there's a nursery rhyme, little Miss Muffet, right? Sat on her tuffet eating her curds and whey. Um, so, you know, whey can be helpful, but a lot of people are dairy reactive. So if you're not, I don't, I don't have a problem with it. Uh, go down on that. Okay. Best way to get rid of inflammation in the gut, how to get started. No grain, no pain. Christina, no grain, no pain. That's the best way. That's how to get started. Um, read the book first. Come back to, to my channel, watch a lot of our videos, and um, start working your way through the knowledge base because it's knowledge that's power, right? And if you're willing to get educated, then you can take action on that education, then you can change your life forever for the better. Don't let anybody tell you any differently. If they do, they're trying to sell you something or they're just liars or they're just uneducated and they're trying to make you do what they do because they don't want to feel bad because they're not healthy themselves and they want you to continue your course of poor health in an effort so they don't have to ask themselves the question, how do I need to make a change in my life? That's just the psychology of sick people sometimes. Okay, I think we got to wrap it up at 7.15 and um, I'm going to go home and eat some dinner. I hope you guys have a fantastic week. Thanks for tuning in to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Look, again, if you're new to the show, come visit me at glutenfreesociety.org. Make sure you sign up for our newsletter there. It's the one way we can ensure you won't uh, get censored and we can get information to you consistently into the future. I got two more notices from YouTube on videos that they censored from my channel this week. So it's, it's probably just a matter of time. The more I talk about truth, the more they don't like it. So um, if you want to keep hearing truth, make sure you're on my email list. Okay, we'll see you next week, same time, Monday night, 6 p.m. Central Standard for another episode. Take care. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain Show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe. And once you do, click that bell. That bell is gonna allow us to remind you right before we go live. But it's also gonna allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much and I'm wishing you excellent health have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.